Hello and welcome to the Political History of the United States, Episode 1.32, Season 1 Review, Part 2. Welcome back, everybody. We are ready to jump right back into the second part of our season in review. This is going to wrap up the first season and put to bed our early colonial era. For those of you wondering how the podcast is going to go from here, really, you're not going to see much difference. I got ahead a little bit, so I'm not going to really need to take that season break that I anticipated. So in two weeks, there will be a new episode, but instead of episode 1 point whatever, we will start with episode 2.1. However, that is enough of chatting about the podcast, so let's just go ahead and jump right in. If Virginia presented colonists with hope of finding riches, New England provided a place offering the promises of an escape from persecution. By the end of the 16-teens, there was an ever-increasing number of Puritans in England. A Puritan is a person who sought to purify the Anglican church to something more pure. This means that they preached less grandeur in their churches, in elimination of idols, and small congregations focused on only the Bible. Religiously, Puritans were Calvinist in nature. Now, the Puritans themselves were not a unified group, with two primary groups emerging. The first group sought to reform the church from within. They believed that the Anglican church was something that could and should be saved. The second group, which was also known as the Brownists, preached separation from the Anglican church, arguing that the church had become so corrupted that there was basically nothing that could save it. For the crown, both groups were a problem. However, the separatists presented special reasons for concern. Remember that the king is the head of the church, and advocating for separation was a direct challenge to the authority of the monarch. By the time that the 1630s roll around, there is a full-scale persecution going on against the Puritans throughout England. However, by that time, the persecutions were as rooted in politics as they were religion. In the early part of the 17th century, the Puritans were a distinct threat to the monarchy. A small group of Puritans was meeting in a small town of Scrooby, England, and upon being discovered by the church, the situation for the group became increasingly dangerous. Deciding that they had no interest in being persecuted, the Scrooby congregation would pack up, cross the English Channel, and resettle in the city of Leiden. Holland during this time was generally more tolerant religiously and provided a refuge for people with unpopular religious beliefs. During their time in light in the group that is now known as the Pilgrims were generally very happy. They laid down roots and the youth grew up embracing the local culture. They became part of the fabric of Leiden. The problem, however, is just that. They had become a part of the city and their kids were wanting to marry the locals. The Pilgrims were an exceptionally insular group. This risk of unwanted outside influence was a serious concern and was viewed as a real risk to the future of the congregation. This, combined with some untimely publishing by William Brewster, proved to be enough to make the Pilgrims realize that they were not safe in Holland. While there was religious toleration, nobody in Holland had any interest in catching the ire of the English. With this in mind and running out of places to relocate, the decision was made to cross the Atlantic and form a new colony. On September 6, 1620, a handful of members from that congregation boarded the Mayflower with plans to cross the Atlantic. The plan had initially been to settle near the mouth of the Hudson. However, dangerous conditions all but rendered this impossible. For one, the Mayflower got a really late start to its journey. Time and time again, the ship was delayed, and by the time they actually reached Cape Cod, winter was quickly approaching. The captain, Christopher Jones, did make an attempt to get to the right place. However, with the weather turning worse, the passengers getting increasingly sick, and with provisions beginning to run very low, it appeared that continuing on to the Hudson was tantamount to a suicide mission. Jones made the decision to head back to Cape Cod and set up shop there. The first and most pressing issue that the Pilgrims saw from this is that they didn't actually have a grant to land in Cape Cod. Without a grant, they had no authority to actually settle the area. The solution in the moment was a compact to establish some kind of authority to settle that region. Signed aboard the Mayflower, this became known as the Mayflower Compact. The actual document is short, completely absent of any practical details, and really is just an agreement to come together as a unified body to handle the issues that will come up. In later years, the Mayflower Compact would become the poster child for an early attempt at a constitution, though more realistically the compact was not a break with the English, but rather something that was very quickly put together to deal with the specific circumstances of landing in Cape Cod and not down near modern-day New York. 
Following the founding of the Plymouth Colony, the Pilgrims would exist as the only English colony in New England for over a decade before the Massachusetts Bay Colony formed. While true that other colonies would from time to time pop up, none of them had the continuing legacy or survived all that long other than Plymouth. The Pilgrims were extremely fortunate also in the fact that they landed in an area where the local Indians had recently been decimated by disease. This means that there was large amounts of open land that was already worked and cleared. It meant that the transition was far easier for them than our friends down in Jamestown. Likewise, unlike in Jamestown, there was no Powhatan Confederacy, nor was there anything really akin to it. This isn't to say that there weren't Native Americans, because there certainly were. However, there is nothing like what Powhatan had in place. Shortly after the founding of Plymouth, diplomacy would open up between the colonists and the local chief of the Wampanoag tribe, Massasoit. Massasoit, with some helpful prodding by the English-speaking Squanto, decided that having the English as an ally beat having them as an enemy. Massasoit would help the Pilgrims survive through that first winter, and in exchange, Massasoit got an agreement that the English would not wage war on him. The problem for the English is that Massasoit was, in fact, not the New England Powhatan. Despite putting on an impressive show upon first contact, the truth remains that Massasoit have far less power and influence than Powhatan did down in the South. So, while it is great that peace was struck between the English and the Indians, let's not confuse this to believe that Plymouth was totally out of the danger zone, as we are about to see. More realistically, as we're about to see during the West Augusted incident, what the Plymouth colonists had actually landed into was a highly complex situation where there were numerous tribes all vying to be the most powerful in the region. This, plus the reliance on the Indian tribes, put the Pilgrims in the dangerous situation of having to attempt to not be manipulated by Massasoit or any of the other Indians who they allied themselves with. This would really rise to the forefront after the arrival of the Liberty and the Swan to form the Wessagusset Colony. The Wessagusset Colony was set up near modern-day Boston. Events back in 1622 saw Squanto attempt to grow his own power base and potentially overthrow Massasoit, largely through the help of the unsuspecting Pilgrims. However, following the death of Squanto and the conclusion to this incident, the Pilgrims quickly found themselves in the middle of another diplomatic nightmare. This forced the Wessagusa colony and the Plymouth colony into an uneasy alliance with each other in the interests of the common defense. Problematically for the Pilgrims is that the warning came from Massasoit directly against the Massachusetts tribe. The Massachusetts had never been outwardly hostile towards the Pilgrims. Yes, they had squabbled in the past because, hey, the Massachusetts tribe wasn't happy that the English were there, but beyond that, there had never been any kind of insinuation of violence from them. Now, however, the Massachusetts tribe and one of their chief warriors, Wittawamit, had been fingered by Massasoit as being a threat to the colony's survival. This is all likewise happening in the backdrop of the 1622 Jamestown Massacre, which meant that William Bradford had to make a decision on how to best protect the colony. Right or wrong, Bradford decided to err on the side of caution. Leading the English defensive effort was Miles Standish, who didn't really seem to mind an opportunity to get some action and push forward with the mission. Upon meeting with the Massachusetts tribal leaders in Wessagusset, Standish proceeded to carry out a slaughter. This incident destroyed the relationship between the Pilgrims and basically everybody not named Massasoit. For Massasoit, it considerably increased his personal power as other tribes suddenly wished to give a wide berth to the English. Overall, however, the impact of the Pilgrims is far more limited than what we were about to see. The Pilgrims were more than happy to remain in their isolated little zone away from the rest of the world where they could happily go along practicing their religion. That is what they wanted anyway when they left Leiden. They were not interested in becoming the biggest colony in the land. They wanted isolation. By the time the 1630s rolls around, we are seeing widespread persecution of Puritans back in England. The Puritans make up a large percentage of Parliament during this time, whom King Charles I didn't really care for. So when he decided to disband Parliament and head into a decade of personal rule, it did not bode well for the Puritans. To make matters worse was Charles' appointment of William Laud to help ensure that there was a single unified church vision, meaning that the wholesale purge of the Puritans was now the name of the game. With many Puritans deciding that they had no interest in getting caught up in this mess, it seemed like it was the time to get the heck out of Dodge. And that is exactly what happened. During the 1630s, nearly 80,000 Puritans would flee England in what would become known as the Great Puritan Migration. Of the nearly 80,000 Puritans who left England during this time and settled elsewhere, 
about a quarter of them would find themselves in New England. New England would rapidly expand from one colony, Plymouth, to six colonies, including Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New Haven, and New Hampshire. And while there can be a great deal of debate over the moves that these colonies made and whether or not they were democratic in nature, the biggest development came while still in England. Namely, while founding the Massachusetts Bay Colony, the original charter proved to be insufficient in that it didn't actually state where the corporate headquarters needed to be located. So for Jamestown, the situation was one where the company headquarters remained in London. Investors heading across the Atlantic, therefore, had very little say-so in how the company was run because, after all, it's not like they could meaningfully participate in company matters if they were in Virginia. The primary consequence of this is that the Virginia company often had a very unrealistic vision of what the colony was doing and little understanding of the conditions on the ground. With the Massachusetts Bay Company, they were able to set up headquarters in Massachusetts itself. This means that for those living in the colony, they are also going to be the same people running the company. On a practical level, this means that the individual colonists had much more say in the daily runnings of the colony. It also gave the colonists a much larger degree of autonomy from the home islands. Charles I was busy with his personal rule, and parliament members were busy seething over not being called back to order. Nobody was really paying attention nor particularly caring about what was going on across the ocean in North America. This limited connection to London for the Massachusetts Bay Colony meant that Massachusetts was basically left to their own devices without any meaningful input from England. Massachusetts and the whole of New England therefore were able to enjoy a particular sense of freedom and independence from the crown. And while I don't want to mislead anybody into thinking that there was any sense in the 1630s and 40s about breaking with England, the New England colonists did enjoy their ability to operate independently from England. And as we will see so much more in the future, once you let the independence genie out of the bottle, it is going to prove very hard to put back in. What we see developed throughout New England are governments that do actually have elements of those freedoms that we will later see so completely define the Constitution. In Massachusetts, for example, we see the body of liberties emerge. Despite the fact that many within the colony, including John Winthrop, objected to having a legal code drafted, the decision was finally made to go ahead and write one. Several of the things inside the body of liberties would survive and become integral parts of the Bill of Rights more than a century later. This includes things such as a rudimentary due process and a right to trial by jury. However, despite the fact that this, along with other portions of the body of liberties, would survive to make their way into the Bill of Rights, I again want to be careful to warn you that you should hold off in thinking that the Massachusetts of 1640 was anything like the Massachusetts of the 1770s. A lot is going to change over the next century and a half. There are still very significant differences between the colony at these two points. Just as an example of that, things like religious freedom absolutely do not exist in New England outside of Rhode Island where outcasts like Roger Williams ended up. In fact, we will see Massachusetts operate in a world where law and religion are very closely intertwined. The political body was carefully curated in a way that ensured that the colony could only shift so far from the central positions, with the central positions being the accepted positions of the Puritan church. The other documents of that time that you should know about was, of course, the Fundamental Orders, which came out of Connecticut. There is some argument that the Fundamental Orders of Connecticut, and this is an argument that typically takes place in Connecticut, is the original written constitution. The Fundamental Orders of Connecticut was an agreement formed between several of the towns in the newly formed Connecticut colony. The agreement operated essentially as a confederation between the various towns around Connecticut. The document laid out how the government should function and gave some basic parameters. While it was not a perfect document, it does go further than we had previously seen at setting up parameters and justifications for the existence of a government. While it may not be completely revolutionary in nature, the fundamental orders of Connecticut are an important attempt to try to establish the boundaries for the government. By the time that 1650 rolls around, New England is comprised of multiple colonies, though the political universe absolutely orbited around Massachusetts. The Great Migration had ended in the 1640s, however, the number of people choosing to return to England remained fairly limited. The majority of the colonists in New England had made lives there. They were not terribly interested in returning to England, especially because England was now mired in civil war, and as New England continued to grow, England was busy doing things like beheading Charles I. 
The civil wars over in England also meant that nobody there was paying that much attention to events across the Atlantic in New England. This, of course, is another example of the autonomy that New Englanders had during this period. New England was basically on their own, and trust me, they were plenty happy with that situation. To the south of New England were the Dutch colony of the New Netherlands in what is now New York. Despite their population near the mouth of the Hudson and a seemingly important advantage for the fur trade, the colony would never become profitable, and by the time the 1630s were being ushered in, the colony had largely been given up on. This isn't to say that the Dutch abandoned their colony, but rather that efforts to make it profitable essentially came to a stop and the colony just maintained the status quo. Likewise, over in Delaware, Sweden made a quick foray into the colonization game before the Dutch rolled through and conquered them. Just shy of 20 years later, the Dutch were forced out of North America by the English. By the time we reached 1650, the colonial United States was growing nicely. However, it is important to also note that, though small, the institution of slavery now existed in the colonies. Slavery prior to 1650 was a limited institution, mostly because the importation of slaves north of the Caribbean was still very expensive. Slavery is going to come to dominate the political story of the United States, and it is an institution that will ultimately cause the United States to live through its most painful period, and will leave scars that will continue to affect American politics long after the Civil War. And while it does get off to a slow start, it is something that is going to remain a major part of our story moving forward. Okay, between our last episode and what I've done so far today, that is my version of a Cliff Notes telling of where we have been so far. Of course, if this is the first episode that you are listening to and you are just trying to catch up, I want to strongly remind you that if you want to know more, please listen to the first 30 episodes. Today really was meant just to be a quick refresher. For the rest of today, I want to spend some time looking at the overarching themes that we have seen thus far. At this point in the podcast, we are setting right around 1650. The colonial United States is roughly 40 years old, and we are already starting to see some of the long-term trends developing that are going to have a marked effect on the history of the future United States. Almost as soon as the first colonies in the United States are founded, we see certain trends appear that will come to define the future of the nation. In so many ways, the story of Jamestown in New England is the story of the United States as a whole. So much of the legend of the United States is that it is a nation founded by people fleeing persecution. And in New England, there is truth to that. Conditions in England were in fact really bad and the Puritans were in very real danger during the 1630s. Yet in that story, Jamestown often seems forgotten. The story of the founding of the United States so often makes it seem like the Mayflower dropped the pilgrims off and that is how colonial America began. However, we know better. Jamestown was already a decade into its existence by the time Plymouth was founded. Jamestown is just as much a part of the story, and in Jamestown, there are central themes that people in the United States continue to hold close. Jamestown was not a people seeking religious freedom, but it was people setting out to make their own fortune. They were plunging into the wilderness and trying to make their way in a difficult world. They had to rely primarily on themselves, and occasionally Powhatan, for their own survival. In the United States, where the idea of the self-made man is such a key part of the culture, the Jamestown settlers were those self-made men. And while it is true that they never found the gold and silver that they were originally looking for, within a few decades they had turned Virginia into the largest exporter of tobacco to Europe. Between these two colonies, you have so many themes that would become central to American culture. The self-made man searching for riches, and yes, in New England, you have settlers fleeing persecution, yearning for the freedom to freely express their religious beliefs. Of course, while both these parts exist, you must also consider the other side, the failures. Jamestown was filled with self-made men, men who were adventure seekers and they were looking for their fortune by going places that others had not gone before. Of course, Jamestown also had an unbelievably high mortality rate, and most of those adventurers ended up dead shortly after arrival. In New England, there was anything but religious freedom. Massachusetts, in particular, was more than happy to chase anybody who was a danger to the status quo out of the colony. Roger Williams and Anne Hutchinson were both too radical for men like John Winthrop. 
Winthrop did all he could to achieve his city on the hill, even if the result was the exclusion of dissidents from his colony. At the same time, we see things that come to dominate how we would think about the United States emerge during this period. In Virginia, England, wanting to attract more settlers, had given a generous land grant program. Combine this with the rise of tobacco, a crop that demands a lot of land, and you can see the origin of what would become the plantation system that will so define the future South. In New England, instead of farmers, you had a much higher percentage of craftsmen and artisans. There was never a single cash crop, but rather there remained the small family farm. The plantation system never develops there as farming was something done on a substance level. While there was often surplus, the amount was limited and generally was simply used for a little bit of extra income. This also helps explain why slavery would ultimately flourish so much more in the South than in the North. Tobacco is a labor-intensive crop. At first, the work is done by indentured servants, but as time passes, it would become African slaves that would end up filling this role. Meanwhile, in New England, there was less need for slave labor because there was less in the way of these labor-intensive crops to care for. At the same time, in Virginia, you had a mix of both wealthy and poor living together. The wealthy could afford to buy the African slaves. In New England, the average person had enough money to pay for their own passage across the Atlantic and had the money to establish a comfortable enough living. However, largely absent was the wealth that existed in the South. Most people in New England could simply not afford to buy a slave, even if they wanted to. If Virginia was home to the upper and lower class, Massachusetts and New England was home to the middle class. Of course, nothing that has happened by 1650 in any way makes the events of the future inevitable. I don't want to lead anybody to believe that events like the American Civil War are somehow preordained by 1650. We have a long way to go before we get to that point, and there are still millions of exit points along the way. It is often difficult to read about the early colonial history of the United States and not read more into events than is actually appropriate. We are living in a world where we have hindsight. We know how the story is going to turn out, and knowing that, it is not surprising that we would want to look back and find ourselves an origin story. We want to find that document, be it the Mayflower Compact, the Massachusetts Body of Liberties, the establishment of the House of Burgesses in Virginia, or the Fundamental Orders in Connecticut, that is going to draw that direct line from one of these early institutions directly to the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights. And while it is tempting to attempt to draw a straight line from the documents of the early colonial experience to those that would become the foundational documents of the United States, the fact remains that this is a difficult connection to make. Yes, the events of the first half of the 17th century will affect events in the latter half of the 18th century. However, there are a whole lot of things that are going to occur in the middle that will ultimately have a more profound effect on the documents coming out of Philadelphia over a century in the future. When looking at the season, if I needed to single out any one takeaway, it would be that large level of autonomy that existed in the colonies. Whether it be from the pragmatic problems related to the distance between North America and England, in oversight in the drafting of the Massachusetts Charter that allowed the colony to base their headquarters in North America, or events in England that distracted from there being better oversight and control over the colonies, the effect is always the same. All throughout colonial North America, there was a degree of autonomy that is going to come to define so much of the future of the colonies. Well, thoughts of separation at this point are not in the minds of anybody, there isn't exactly a large number of colonists advocating for more oversight and control from London. Regardless of the reason, the colonies were largely allowed to grow and develop absent from interference from the home islands. As we move into next season, we are going to see the effects not only of the relative freedom that the colonies enjoyed, but the consequences when England would attempt to increase their control over those colonies. This autonomy is going to set up a situation that we will see in the future where time and time again, when England attempts to reassert their authority over the colonies, the colonists are going to make sure that the English government knows just how little they like that idea. This is a message that they will often pass along violently. That is going to become a major theme for the next several seasons, and spoiler alert guys, it is going to lead to a full-scale war eventually. However, that is for the future.
Next season, we are going to rejoin our story in 1650 and push forward all the way to 1691. During that time, we are going to see the growth of colonies as well as new colonies emerge. We will witness wars against the Indians and rebellions against English control. Finally, we are going to look at the glorious revolution and how it would completely transform the North American English colonies. As I have said previously, the good news is that I actually did get a little bit ahead on writing episodes, so there is not going to be a break in between the first and second season. That means we will be back here in two weeks' time, just like normal, and I will kick off the second season by looking at the Quakers. I want to sincerely thank each and every one of you who has taken the time to listen to this first season, has sent me feedback or encouragement or written me a review. I have thoroughly been enjoying this project, and I can't wait to keep moving it forward. With that, I will be back here in two weeks' time, and we will start season two off by looking at the Quakers. Quakers.